Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Institute. Uh, my name is John Lenchowski. I'm president of the Institute. And uh, I would, uh, and I, I, it's, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, I've been an admirer of Paul Kengor for many, many years. He is uh, one of the most outstanding historians and, and analysts of, of the Cold War, the Reagan administration. And he's one of those who understands the Cold War, not simply in materialistic terms, but in terms of some of its other most deep, deeper, some of its more deep dimensions, uh, including the war of information, the war of ideas, and the underlying moral conflict uh, which, which it represents. Uh, Paul is a is professor at uh, Grove City College, professor of political science. Um, he. Uh, is uh, the executive director of its Center for Vision and Values, which, if you don't know, it's uh, uh, it, it has a, a, a an email list uh, or a, a blog. I don't know what you exactly call it, but I get all of the emails and I think they're outstanding. Uh, the uh, uh, Paul is also a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution uh, at Stanford University. He has written uh, so many books, I'm not, I can't count them all. They are all outstanding. Uh, and I'm not going to waste your time anymore except to say that uh, I'm delighted that you're here, Paul. You are rendering uh, the cause of American national security and the protection of our civilization a great service by your scholarly work. And, and so I thank you for this. We owe you all a debt of great gratitude. The floor is yours. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, John. It's uh, too kind, and uh, definitely too kind. As, as uh, Bill Clark used to say, who John worked for, you're easily deceived. You're e easily deceived. And, uh, and, and, and speaking of which, I'm, I'm going to embarrass him, but uh, Bill Clark's son, Colin Clark, is here today. And Bill just or Colin just happened to be in town, got our email on this last night, and so flew in from Colorado, I guess, right? So really, really great to great to have him here. May I just interrupt? And yeah, say, please. Colin, I've got a, a picture of your father and the president up there on the "I Love Me" wall. And, uh, <laughs> I'd love you to see it. So thank you yeah. for being here. No thank you for having me. Yeah, but no, I've been an admirer of this place for a long time. I send my students here. I recommend it to my students. And I think the last time that I was here, I'm guessing was, well, see, Dupe, the book Dupes came out in about 2010. And it must have been around 2007, 2008. And I was sitting right over there somewhere by that bookshelf in the corner with Herb Romerstein. And it was, um, it was Herb that I dedicated this book to. Um, Herb and uh, Arnold Beachman, and so you know, Herb helped get me going on this. So that's uh, it would come really full circle, and and also to uh, Ken DeGraff and Reed, who's who's not here, but I'm an admirer of, of his as well. Mac Owens, thank you for all your work and, uh, and all, all that you're doing. I remember sitting one more Bill Clark story, but I remember sitting in the Tack Barn as your dad used to call it, right, at the, at the ranch in Shandon, Paso Robles, California, and sitting there looking through all these old documents that if any archivist would have seen that these documents were sitting in the tack barn, she would have had a heart attack. But, but you know, Bill kept everything, and there were these heartfelt letters, personally written longhand by John, by Ken, by Roger Robinson, and a few other of uh, the cadre that Bill called them at the National Security Council, begging and pleading with him not to leave in October 1983, but um, but he did. And and Bill was Bill was a very religious man, and he believed that uh, the DP, the Divine Plan, as he and Ronald Reagan called it, called on him at that point. It was okay to leave. He believed that the, that the plan was in. The plan was in process. They had it there. They had laid it out, and they had laid out the plan to prevail and win the Cold War. And looking back in retrospect, he was there just long enough 
to lay it all out, to put the, all those NSDDs, 300 some NSDDs in the Reagan administration. And uh, Bill Clark oversaw about 100, 110 of them in the short two year period that he was there. NSD 32, 66, 75, all the crucial ones involved in the takedown of the Soviet Union. But, uh, but I could talk about that all day. I, I'm here, to, here today to talk about dupes, which is one of my favorite subjects. And I could talk about dupes for hours and days. So you'll have to probably, probably stop me at some point as I could go on and on with different examples of this. That, that final book that, that I turned in was about, about 250,000 words. And how many pages did this end up? Over 600 pages, small print. And I used to joke, half jokingly, that this could be volume one of a multi-volume set. Which is, uh, which is true. And that's really a sad testimony to the different people who, um, a dupe is really an, an, an innocent. A dupe doesn't intend malicious, uh, doesn't have malicious intent. A dupe unwittingly aids and abets the enemy. And if you think about it, that's an especially dangerous situation where you have people aiding and abetting, and in the case of Soviet communism, evil. And they don't even realize that they're doing it. I, emptied up the, I opened up the book with a quote from Whitaker Chambers in Witness. And the dupes that the communists used were liberals, progressives, people on the left, right? That's just, that's who they would go after. That, that's who was closest to them ideologically. Liberals and progressives weren't communists, but they were on the left. So it's going to be much easier to dupe if you're a communist, a liberal, or a progressive than it is a right winger, right? But Whitaker Chambers in Witness said, while communists make full use of liberals and their solicitudes and sometimes flatter them to their faces, in private they treat them with that sneering contempt that the strong and predatory almost invariably feel for the victims who help to volunteer in their own victimization. That's, pretty, that's a pretty damning statement. But, uh, but Whitaker Chambers would know. He knew. So I'm going to give you a few examples today. John Dewey, who was what I called a, a Potemkin progressive. I'll explain what those are. Margaret Sanger. That'll be fun, right? You guys, some of you happy I picked Margaret Sanger? I mean, I've got hundreds, and this is the you know, four or five that I came up with. Frank Marshall Davis and, uh, and Ted Kennedy. In, in honor of Mac, I had to pick, uh, pick, pick Ted Kennedy. And also, too, I'll, I'll conclude if I have time, if you don't throw me out by then, by um, giving a, an example from the theme of, of my new book, which is on, it's called Takedown, and it's on how the, the communist left and the left generally has slowly but surely sought to undermine family and marriage. So a nice, neutral, non-incendiary topic there that's, that's winning me, a, getting a lot of new friends and winning me a lot of kind emails. But so to start, this term dupe, where does this come, come from? And, uh, and it, was, it was hard doing a book called Dupes because people think that that's name calling, right? And, uh, and I teach at a Christian college. And as a Christian, I'm supposed to be charitable. And I try to, right? It's one of the things I always work on. And so to give the, a book the title Dupes, it seems like you're calling people names. But in fact, that's a term that was very common during the Cold War and that communists used all the time to refer to the people that they were duping, hoodwinking. Suckering is another, is another term that was used. So it was very common during that time. A lot of people don't realize that that term goes back much, much further. In George Washington's farewell address, he warns of dupes. So the father of our country actually used the term dupes. Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations used the word dupes. And in fact, there's even uh, in some translations of scripture, the word duped or duped appears. In fact, the, I believe it's the New American Bible translation. And if you don't actually find that exact word duped, there are phrases over and over again about being fooled, misled, warning people essentially not to be duped, if, the, if it doesn't explicitly use that word duped. So, uh, and why did it matter for the Cold War in particular? Because the Soviets were masters at this. They were masters of manipulation, of agitation and propaganda. 
they really sought out to do this, unlike any other group that I could think of. I mean, you know, men sat around and tried to think of ways to mislead people that were a little bit over to their left, or I guess it'd be a little over to their right on, on the spectrum, but, but still on the left. Willie Munzenberg, who in the massive Appendix 9, 2100 pages released by Congress a half a century ago, the first name that they come up with is the first name there is Willie Munzenberg, who's referred to as the, as the Henry Ford of, of organization among the communists. Grigory Zinoviev, first head of the Comintern. Vladimir Lenin used the term useful idiots. There's some debate over what exactly Lenin said there. Probably the most direct Russian translation would translate into deaf mutes. But, but Lenin said, find these people, use them. You know, as, as Chambers would say, flatter them to their faces, but really privately treat them with that sneering contempt that, that these victims don't even realize, these people that don't even realize that, that they're being used. George Lukash who was the Hungarian communist, the cultural commissar, under uh, the, the, when the communists launched their rev, uh, revolution in the, in the 1910s. He was a master at this. Lukash, through the Marx-Engels Institute in 1920, 21, 22, along with Karl Radek and a number of other hardcore communists in the Soviet Union, they eventually founded what became known as the Frankfurt School of Cultural Marxists, an extremely influential group of communists. You guys should do a whole course on the cultural Marxists. You probably do. Another reason why this is a, this is a great place. But uh, they, they have had, they have enormous damage the cultural Marxists have, have wrought on the country through education, sex, and, uh, and culture. That was their recipe for taking down the West. Not through economics, the classic Marx-Engels mold, but through culture. But dupes, why were dupes so important to what uh, the communists wanted to do? In America, the Communist Party, the American Communist Party, never got to be more than about 100,000 members in the 1930s. So if you really wanted influence, you needed a much wider circle of different people to bring in, to try to attract, to try to bring to your cause. People that didn't realize that they were being drawn in and, re and recruited to the cause. So some examples of this. John Dewey and the Potemkin Progressives. I use that term Potemkin Progressives in, in, in dupes. Potemkin villages were what? These were villages in the Soviet Union that were set up for the purpose of misleading or duping Westerners. You take them and you show them this new factory. You show them this new nursery. You show them this new school. And the factory is producing things that would just blow away anything in the imagination of, of, of Westerners, but it's a fake. So you would have these fake villages. The North Koreans are notorious for this. The Cubans did it. The, the communist Chinese under, under Mao did this. So they would create these, these Potemkin villages, and these were really pushed in the 1920s and 1930s on American and Western progressives. Who, who kind of, if you really think about it, I mean, a lot of progressivism simply wants an evolution, whereas the communists wanted a revolution. And I'm amazed again and again and again, I'll show you some examples with Margaret Sanger, where, where progressives are now in 2015 is where Moscow was in like 1925 or 1935. Moscow just wanted to get there right away for the progressive movement. They never went quite as far to the left, but they would, they would take their time and come to this more slowly. So a lot of progressives in the 1920s and 1930s thought that maybe the Soviets, maybe the Bolsheviks had truly discovered the brave new world, right? Maybe they were doing what we need to do now, and maybe they're just getting there a little closer, a little faster, and let's go over and take a look. So the Soviets welcomed by the literal boatload People, groups of educators, labor union officials from, from New York, wherever, would, 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 take, would take the boat, cross the water, go into Europe, eventually take trains, get all the way to the Soviet Union. One of them, H.G. Wells, who was uh, not American, of course, right, but British. After meeting Joe Stalin in 1934, said this, I've never met a man more candid, fair, and honest. 
everyone trusts him. Everyone trusts him. Or at least everyone that H.G. Wells saw or was allowed to see trusted Stalin. Wells likewise had been impressed by Vladimir Lenin, who he called a frank, refreshing, and amazing little man. An amazing little man. Wells' fellow socialists, who were the British socialists? Who were one of the, the much slower Fabians. Fabians. Learn the Fabian socialists. Very important. Much more similar to where a lot of our modern progressives are. His fellow uh, socialists. George Bernard Shaw. Was, uh, was very impressed with Stalin, and after a meeting with Stalin said this, we, meaning us in the West, we cannot afford to give ourselves moral errors, to be arrogant, superior, when our most enterprising neighbor, the Soviet Union, humanely and judiciously liquidates a handful of exploiters and speculators to make the world safe for honest men. You guys don't believe me, right? Let me read that again. We cannot afford to give ourselves moral errors when our most enterprising neighbor, the Soviet Union, humanely and judiciously liquidates a handful of exploiters and speculators to make the world safe for honest men. And that was precisely what Stalin had told him, and he totally believed it. Uh, Shaw praised the utilitarian killing, quote unquote, that the Soviet Union was doing to, after all, make a better place. You know, as Lenin said, as Stalin said, you have to break a few eggs and make an omelet. Trotsky said, we will not arrive in the kingdom of socialism on a polished floor with white gloves. Some blood will have to be spilled. One person who saw this who was a leftist at the time was Malcolm Muggridge, the famous British journalist with the BBC, and uh, he later on became a big convert to Christianity as well. In fact, uh, Muggers gets a lot of credit for, for introducing Mother Teresa to the wider West. Here's some of his work in the 1970s. But Muggeridge was a man of the left, went there in the 1920s, and was, was so shocked by what he saw in the Soviet Union, including the conversion of churches into atheist, mu atheist museums, that it had just the opposite effect on him. It probably started, it did start him on his road toward uh, being really a, con a conservative Christian. But he talked about these Potemkin progressives that he observed in the Soviet Union. Here's what he wrote. They are unquestionably one of the wonders of the age. And I shall treasure till I die as a blessed memory the spectacle of them traveling with radiant optimism through a famished Soviet countryside. Wandering in happy bands about squalid, overcrowded towns, listening with unshakable faith to the fatuous patter of carefully trained and indoctrinated Soviet guides. They would repeat like school children a multiplication table, the bogus statistics and mindless slogans endlessly intoned to them. There were earnest advocates of the humane killing of cattle who looked up at the massive headquarters of the OGPU with tears of gratitude in their eyes. Earnest advocates of, prop of proportional representation who eagerly assented when the necessity of the dictatorship of the proletariat was explained to them. There were earnest clergymen I saw who walked reverently through anti-God museums and reverently turned the pages of atheistic literature. There were earnest pacifists who watched delightly tanks rattle across Red Square and bombing planes darken the sky. There were earnest town planning specialists who stood outside overcrowded ramshackle tenements and muttered, if only we had something like this in England. Not only was Muggeridge uh, mystified by this naivete, but so were Soviet officials. You should read some of their accounts. They couldn't believe how easy it was to mislead Western progressives. They were stunned. They're like, this is really easy. This is almost too easy. Maybe we, maybe we need to throw these people in the gulag. Maybe they're spies, right? Muggridge, the Soviet officials, the almost unbelievable credulity of these mostly university-educated tourists astonished even Soviet officials who were used to handling foreign visitors. I talked to Charlie Wiley, who was a very good friend with Herb Romerstein. They used to do the World Youth Fe uh, Festivals together, testified before Congress together. Charlie's still around. He's about 87 years old. And Charlie told me about going on a tour in Romania. And 
it was mostly progressives. He was probably the only anti-communist in the group. And after a couple of days, he kind of, the guide kind of realized in Charlie that he could trust him, and he opened up to him, which was a very dangerous thing to do. And he said, I could tell you're one of the only people that is, isn't being hoodwinked by all the you know, BS that I'm feeding you here. And so they talked about it, and, and the guy said, maybe you could give me some advice. There's a few of us, the, the Romanians, what they had to do is they had, had to hire Western educated Romanians because they spoke the language and they could deal with, with Westerners, right? And he said, me and a few of the other guides, we're all totally anti-communist. We don't like this stuff at all. And, and, but we can't believe how easily everybody accepts whatever we spoon feed them. So we came up with this plan because we can't just tell them that we're lying for the state. So we came up with this plan to exaggerate beyond any possible ability like, and this comrade is a factory that is producing 10,000 tons of beef a week. Like, and he said, but it's an amazing thing we've learned that no matter how much we exaggerate, they just nod and say, wow, this is amazing. I can't wait to go back home and tell all those red-baiting McCarthyites, you know, what an amazing thing they're doing here in Romania. So, but Mugridge saw the same thing. Said Mugridge... Interesting thing about these individuals, they were universally progressives. These fellow passengers provided my first experience of the progressive elite from all over the world who attached themselves to the Soviet regime, resolved to believe anything that they were told by its spokesmen. Any psychiatrists in the room? Maybe this is something that a psychiatrist would have an easier time dealing with than a political scientist. But that's an interesting phrase, resolved to, to believe anything that they were told. They, wanted, they went in wanting to believe. This was the brave new world, and they wanted it to be the brave new world. They were mostly academics and writers, said Mugridge, all upholders of progressive causes and members of progressive organizations. They were ecstatic about playing a part in this drama of the 20th century ready at any moment to rush on a stage, cheering and gesticulating, a Western version of the devotees of Krishna who throw themselves under the wheels of the great juggernaut. So that was Mugridge. One of the Potemkin progressives was John Dewey, founding father of American public education, Columbia University professor. If you had to come up with a list of the six most important progressives of all time, Dewey would be on that list. He is an absolute icon. They, should, they have essentially photos of him in every education department framed on the wall in America. They don't have quite that. Everybody has to read his books. His books, including books like Democracy and Education, the 1916 classic, have been required reading in our teachers' colleges for literally about 100 years. Dewey was uh, one thing that they don't teach about Dewey in those programs is that the Bolsheviks absolutely adored his educational work. They began immediately translating his work into Russian as quickly as they could. They said, here in these writings of this would-be founding father of American public education is a blueprint for what we want to do in the Soviet communist totalitarian system. In 1918, Bolshevik Revolution 1917, right? Russian Civil War 1918 to 1921. In 1918, when they first started fighting the Russian Civil War, well, you think they'd have other, other priorities going on. Three years after it was published in the United States, Dewey's Schools of Tomorrow was published in Moscow. In 1919, Dewey's How We Think was published in Moscow. In 1920, Dewey's The School and Society was published in, in Moscow. And then in 1921, Dewey's Democracy and Education, published in Moscow, even before, uh, before the Civil War was over. Now, you might think here that for Dewey, you would stop and pause and think, you know, if the Bolsheviks really like my stuff this much, maybe, maybe I ought to reevaluate <laughs> re what I'm doing. But Dewey was flattered. Dewey, Dewey was honored by this, really impressed. There's a mutual admiration society developed. And in 1928, Professor Dewey joined a delegation of 25 American educators, mostly from Columbia, but other uh, colleges in, in the Northeast, 
on a, on a pilgrimage to the Soviet Union so they could go over there and see this brave new world for, for themselves. Now, Dewey actually wrote about this later. When Dewey comes back, he's going to write a six-part series for the New Republic. If any of you want to do some interesting research, I was going to have a chapter in this book on the New Republic being dupes, but, but I haven't done that. Somebody else, please do it. Okay, you won't be able to get through a few issues and just be blown away. I mean, it's just unbelievable how bad. If, if National Review had been this much of an apologist for a, a fringe right-wing regime, it would cease to exist. Everybody would remember it as carrying water for whoever. But the left, TNR, and they said they can get away with it. So Dewey said when he came back, uh, he talked about, uh, quote, the warning that was given to me that appears humorous in retrospect so often given to me by my friends. And what was that warning? The warning of, against being fooled by being taken to so-called show places, right? So-called show places. Ah, he said, the Russians had enough to do on their own without bothering to set up show establishments to impress a few hundred or even thousand tourists. But he did note that uh, places and institutions were shown to us, and they may well have been the best of their kind, but only in, the, in order that these places and institutions, quote, might be representative of what the new regime is trying to do, unquote. So Dewey comes back and he writes his six-part series for the New Republic. He says, my mind was in a whirl of the new impressions that I saw in Leningrad, in, in Moscow. Readjustment was difficult, and I lived somewhat dazed by, by what I saw. Dewey was dizzied by this wondrous new world he was discovering. The outstanding fact, he wrote in the New Republic in his first, edition, uh, first piece, is Russia is in a revolution involving a release of human powers on such an un unprecedented scale that it is, of, it is of incalculable significance, not only for that country, but also for the world. One of the things that he noted he is he was especially impressed by the restoration of Russian Orthodox churches by the Bolshevik regime and their interests in particular in preserving the art. And uh, I, when, I, when I read the Columbia University press book that collected all of Dewey's Russia writings and they had that part where he hailed the rest, restoration of Russian churches, the admiring editor from Columbia Teachers College put a gentle footnote on the bottom that said, Apparently, Professor Dewey was, uh, was unaware of the vast attacks on religion in Moscow by the Bolsheviks. Dewey said he was especially impressed by, quote, the orderly and safe character of life in Russia under Stalin. He said uh, he understands that this would be, quote, met with incredulity by probably much more than half of the European as well as the American public. But nonetheless, he saw something safe and orderly. And then he said this, he did allow for the fact that, well, certain people were being targeted. This is a direct quote, I'm not making this up. In spite of secret police, inquisitions, arrests, deportations of netmen and kulaks, despite the exiling of party opponents, including divergent elements in the party, life for the masses goes on with regularity, safety, and decorum. That wasn't a sarcastic statement, he meant that sincerely. There is no place in all of Europe, in fact, where the external routine of life is more settled and secure, said Dewey. By his third article for the New Republic, he proclaimed the Bolshevik Revolution a quote-unquote great success. He was, a, he was especially impressed by what was going on in the Russian public schools, because that's what Dewey, uh, Dewey was all about, right? Public schools. And Dewey was all about what in education? You guys know? Experimentation. Right? Experimentation. So he called this idea on the Bolsheviks, he, he held the great experiment that was being done. Because a lot of progressives were talking about the Soviet Union being a great experiment. He talked about the great experiment in education. He said, I think the schools are a dialectic factor in the evolution of Russian communism. And then he also came back at the very end of, of the, in his final series, part six, this is interesting. A lot of people don't realize this. One of the main reasons that they bought the, brought these progressives to the United States, or brought these uh, progressives from the West to the Soviet Union at the time, they wanted 
uh, Stalin, Lenin first and then Stalin, badly wanted diplomatic recognition of the Soviet Union by the West. And the Western governments wouldn't do it. Churchill told Lloyd George, you might as well recognize sodomy be, be, before you recognize the Bolshevik regime. Woodrow Wilson, I've got a full chapter in here on Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson, conservatives don't understand this. There's a lot to object to that about Woodrow Wilson. But Woodrow Wilson was an excellent anti-communist. And, and Wilson said, these people are terrorists, barbarians, and tyrants. He said, I will absolutely not, not recognize the Bolshevik regime. Uh, William Christian Bullitt, William C. Bullitt, who was a duped progressive but went on to become an outstanding anti-communist, um, left Wilson's team because of this, because he was so fed up with Wilson that he wouldn't recognize the Bolsheviks. Um, all, the, all the different Republicans and the presidents in the 1920s wouldn't recognize the Bolsheviks. Who's the first one who did? FDR. FDR did. But so part of what Stalin is doing here is he's literally whining and dining, getting these, some of these guys really drunk, giving them all the food that they want. I have a picture in the book of um, Ted Kennedy being taken to a mock Soviet wedding. Um, Yuri Bezmenov said that it, that's actually, it was an actual fake wedding. They would set up fake weddings in the Soviet Union for Westerners as a way to kind of throw a party, um, make it look like re that religious ceremonies were allowed in the country. I cite in the book, I think it's a 1958 New York Times piece on the phenomenon of fake weddings in the Soviet Union. Oh yeah, you run a totalitarian regime, man. You can do all kinds of stuff, right? Fake weddings. Fake weddings. Kennedy dancing with the bride, the quote-unquote bride, at a Soviet wedding after he consumed a lot of alcohol, too. So anyway, Dewey concludes his six-part series on the New Republic with this. Oh, and by the way, political recognition of Russia on the part of the United States would bring about the kind of relations that are in the interest of both countries and of the world. And then he says this really telling statement. I went to Russia with no conviction on that subject. But he came back urging in his wrap-up, we should extend diplomatic recognition to Russia. In other words, Professor Dewey did exactly, exactly what Stalin wanted. It worked, it worked beautifully. Somebody else who, who went there, and I, I can't talk all day, so I'll keep an eye on the clock. I want to leave time for your questions. Margaret Sanger went there in 1934. Margaret Sanger was the founder of Planned Parenthood, which was initially the American Birth Control League. And Margaret Sanger wanted um, uh, Planned Parenthood first for reasons of birth control, not yet abortion. She didn't come around to, to legalize abortion and, and, until later, which is ironic because now Planned Parenthood is America's largest abortion, abortion provider. But she wanted, uh, she wanted birth control for purposes of women being able to space their births but also for racial eugenics. Margaret Sanger spoke to the Silver Lake, New Jersey chapter of the KKK in, uh, in 1926. It's on pages 366 to 367 of her memoirs. It's, um, it's probably, if you go and find it in the library of your ever secular university, those pages are probably ripped out. Uh, but she wrote quite openly about, she had to wait for hours and then, then the people came in with the hoods, and then the flaming crosses, and then Sanger went in and spoke to the KKK gals. Such a hit that she missed her train back to New York and had to spend the night. Got a whole bunch of invitations after that. And why would the KKK like Sanger? Well, because of Sanger's talk about race improvement, racial eugenics, her Negro project. None of this stuff is talked about when they give out the Sanger Award every year at Planned Parenthood. When Hillary Clinton won her Sanger Award, I think it was 2008, she talked about how she was in awe of Margaret Sanger. And there was no editorials anywhere in the New York Times or Washington Post of, well, you know, Margaret Sanger spoke to the KKK in 1926. Hillary Clinton must be a closet-hooded racist. Nothing like that. If you're a progressive, you can get away with all of this kind of stuff. But so Sanger went there she made her pilgrimage in 1934 because she wanted to see what the Soviets were doing with birth control. One of the first things that the, that the Bolsheviks did in 1920, they legalized abortion and they legalized divorce. 
And within 10 to 12 years, they had rates of divorce and abortion never before seen in the history of the world. I've got a full chapter in this in my, my new book, Takedown. It was not unusual by 1930 to meet Russian couples that had already been divorced 10 times. The, uh, the number, the uh, abortion got so out of control that by 1936, Stalin had to ban it because he said, there's not going to, we're not going to have a Russia. 20 years of this keeps up. For which Trotsky really gave him hell because Trotsky said, Comrade, you're going to be a good communist. You must have abortion. You must have abortion. I mean, Marx and Engels wrote about the abolition of the family. You must have abortion. You must have divorce. So Khrushchev brought it back in 1955. By, um, by the 1970s, the Soviet Union was averaging 7 to 8 million abortions per year. The, the worst year in America, Roe v. Wade, was about 1.5 million. And they had the same population that we did, roughly. So 7 to 8 million a year. So Sanger goes there in 1934. She wants to see what's, what's going on, right? She, and she gets there, and for one thing, I'm going to read a quote from her on this. She is, um, she's appalled by the number of abortions. She said, in Moscow alone, Soviet officials are telling me there's like 100,000 abortions. This is unbelievable. I, the founder of Planned Parenthood was kind of aghast at this. And she says here, though, that um, no worry about this. By the way, this is progressivism in a nutshell. Listen to what they tell her and how she's assuaged by this. Uh, she writes this in her Birth Control Review. The masthead of Birth Control Review, her founding publication, said to create a race of thoroughbreds. And in the, in, in the June 1935 issue of Birth Control Review, she wrote on her pilgrimage to Russia. And she said here, the total number of abortions is not known, but the number for Moscow alone is roughly estimated at, at about 100,000 per year. Which, by the way, that was right. That was correct. However, all the Soviet officials with whom I discussed the matter stated that as soon as the economic and social plans of Soviet Russia are realized... Neither abortions nor contraception will be necessary or desired. You see the belief, the progressive belief in utopia. Once you fully get the state doing everything and all the wondrous things that the state needs to do, every progressive and leftist believes that, that you know, they simply haven't had enough power yet to really do what they want. But when they really can truly, really, really, really do what they want, it'll all work out. Uh, Neither abortions nor contraception will be necessary or realized. Listen to this quote from the founder of Planned Parenthood. A functioning communist society will assume the happiness of every child and will assume the full responsibility for its welfare and education. So Sanger was a little bit off on that one. From 100,000 abortions a year in Moscow in 1934 to, eh, 7, 8 million a year in the 1970s. One more thing. She wrote a piece, uh, she said this in her piece, Birth Control in Russia. And this shows, this is fascinating because this is where American progressives are today. Theoretically, there are no obstacles to birth control in Russia. It is accepted on the grounds of health and human rights. We in America could well take example from Russia where there are no legal restrictions, no religious uh, condemn condemnation, and where birth control is part of the regular welfare service of the government. And that's where we are in America now, where birth control is part of the regular welfare service of the government, the Obama HHS mandate. And if you disagree with it, you favor a war on women. You hate women, period. So it's part of the regular welfare service of the government. All right, a couple more, and then I'll wrap up. Frank Marshall Davis, real quick. Um, I wrote a full book on Davis. It's called The Communist. Frank Marshall Davis was a mentor to Barack Obama in the 1970s. Davis was born in 1905, died in 1987. Um, I have a 600-page FBI file. And uh, in the book, The Communist, I reprint about 20 pages from that FBI file. One of them is, um, is this summary right here, his data sheet which includes his Communist Party USA number, 47544. So we knew his actual Communist Party number. 
And uh, Davis was introduced to Obama by Obama's maternal grandfather, Stanley Dunham. It would have been in the fall of 1970. There are witnesses to that happening. Stanley Dunham knew that his, um, his grandson needed a role model, a kind of father figure, because he didn't have a father at home. And so Stanley Dunham, in particular, Stanley Dunham felt that, that his grandson needed a, a black male role model. And so instead of picking, like, you know, the Little League coach or scoutmaster or whatever, he picks the one person known in all of Honolulu as Old Red Frank. So he picked uh, a guy that was called to Washington by the Democrats in 1956 to testify in his, quote, uh, scope of Soviet activities in the United States, unquote. So it gives you an indication of Obama's grandfather, how far to the left his politics were. The, uh, the grandfather and Frank Marshall Davis used to play cards and checkers together. They used to drink together, and they also used to smoke dope together in, uh, in the 1960s. So imagine these two men in their 60s and the 1960s smoking pot together. So Obama comes from a very unusual political background unusual political background. Davis, uh, Frank Marshall Davis joined the Communist Party in Chicago during World War II, after the signing of the Hitler-Stalin Pact, which was when a lot of people left the Communist Party, especially Jewish communists. A lot of them left after the signing of the Hitler-Stalin Pact. Frank joined after the Hitler-Stalin Pact. He was, um, why do I have him in dupes? Why do I talk about him in dupes? He was a, a master at hoodwinking people on the left was very, very good at this. He would describe himself, as many of these communists do, as a progressive. And that's a very difficult thing. And you'll hear people like Glenn Beck say, and he gets beat up for it, that when you hear the word progressive, think communist. No, you can't, because progressive doesn't actually mean communist. But I'm sympathetic to what Beck is saying, because so many communists will call themselves progressives to cloak their communism that sometimes you can't tell the difference. But Frank called himself a progressive in the best Jeffersonian uh, use of the term, as he put it. His, um, his very first editorial in the Chicago Star, which was the Communist Party publication that Frank Marshall Davis was the founding editor-in-chief. And the first editorial, July 4th, 1946, was called Those Radicals of 76, where Davis, Frank Marshall Davis, Obama's mentor, invoking the idea of a fundamental transformation of society. Talked about how we needed to be like the American founders. Right? So they, would, they, they, they did this all the time. I've got a full chapter in the, the Communists called Our Communist Founding Fathers. The, the, the Communists were great at hijacking the American founders, especially Tom Paine. Citizen Tom Paine was a book by Howard Fast, the Stalin Prize winner, that um, used Tom Paine to basically argue that uh, Tom Paine was a revolutionary just like the modern American communist revolutionaries. They fought to try to get that book used in New York public schools, which was a huge battle. Well, they ought to try again. Maybe they'd get it in now if they, if they worked out a little harder right now. So, so Davis, did, um, Davis was great in particular at uh, misleading the religious left. When I asked um, Herb Romerstein, when I first started doing research on dupes, and uh, I, I said, Herb, was there one particular group that the communists had greater success at hoodwinking more than others? Maybe educators, college professors, Hollywood. He said, the religious left. He said, the, the religious left were, as, as Herb put it, the greatest suckers of them all, especially from, from the mainline denominations. Right? They were really easy to get. I have in the book, um, in The Communists, I have two chapters on this in Dupes. The group, the American Peace Mobilization. Are any of you familiar with that group? Fascinating, scary. And, and, and if, if, if this doesn't bother you, I don't know what will. If you're a liberal, this ought to make steam come out of your ears. That ought to make you so angry. The American Peace Mobilization was set up out of Chicago in 1940. I, I reprint the document in dupes. We, it's now in the Common Turn archives in CPUSA at the Library of Congress, where the Common Turn says flat out that they set up the American Peace Mobilization at a conference in Chicago in September 1940. And I believe Davis was there. I'm pretty sure he was there. And uh, on the welcoming committee, part of that, too, was also um, Valerie Jarrett's um, grandfather 
was also part of that group as well. Valerie Jarrett's grandfather and father-in-law um, knew Frank Marshall Davis in Chicago's Communist Party circles in the 1940s. By the way, they also all do the Cantor family, which would go on to mentor a fellow by the name of David Axelrod. And in, and in, in the Chicago Star that Davis edited, you could find actual campaign announcements for the Cantors. In fact, the Cantors, um, the Cantor family mentored David Axelrod. The senior Cantor in the 1930s, the whole Cantor family lived in Moscow, where they were official translators of Lenin's writings for the Soviet government. Cantor ran for, for vice president on the Communist Party ticket in the 1930s. But, uh, but, but the Cantors, one of the Cantors was on the group that bought the Chicago Star from Frank Marshall Davis to help Davis leave to go to Honolulu in 1948. Oh, and the name of the purchasing group? The Progressive Publishing Company. The, the Progressive Publishing Company. But the American Peace Mobilization was created in 1940 to keep America out of World War II and from giving any aid to the British as they were under assault by the Nazis. Why? Because it was a communist front group organization that backed Stalin. And at that point in time, Hitler and Stalin were allies. So American communists, as Herb always said, American communists were Soviet patriots. It was the Soviet Union first. So they had to do what Stalin did so they argued, they put together an American peace mobilization. I counted one in every four members of the American peace mobilization was a minister. They weren't communists. They were religious left ministers. But they put together this American peace mobilization to keep America out of the war. Now, you're not going to believe this because it's so blatantly unbelievable. That just... The group on June 22nd, 1941, Change his name from the American Peace Mobilization to the American People's Mobilization and became war hawks overnight. They were outside of the White House protesting for like 60 days for that fascist Roosevelt. These guys were no friends of the Democrats. For that fascist Roosevelt to stop all Lend-Lease aid to Britain. Keep America out of the war. June 22, 1941, they literally put down their signs and walked away from the White House and became gung-ho pro-war and became the American People's Mobilization. Why? Why did they become so suddenly pro-war June 22nd, 1941? Anyone know what happened that day? The Nazi, invasion. the Nazi invasion. The Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. So now, right, their country, these, these communist Americans, now their country had been invaded, the Soviet Union. And so now it was time to be pro-war. All right, I'm going to stop it there because I want to take your questions. It's almost 2.30. I wanted to talk about Ted Kennedy. Um, I also wanted to give some other examples, but I'm, I'm going to run out of time here. Oh, last one because this will take 30 seconds. One of my favorite examples. Jimmy Carter, 1994, in Pyongyang, North Korea. I had very free discussions with Kim and with his ministers. He's very friendly toward Christianity, unquote. Describing life in North Korea, 1994, Jimmy Carter. People are busy. They work 48 hours a week. Rosalind and I found Pyongyang to be a bustling city. The only difference is that during working hours, there are very few people on the street. They all have jobs or go to school. And after working hours, the North Koreans pack the department stores which Rosalind and I visited. I went in one of them. It's like Walmart in American stores on a Saturday afternoon. They all walk around in there, and they seem in fairly good spirits. Pyongyang at night looks like Times Square. Have you ever seen the photo of North Korea at night, of the Korean Peninsula at night, where the, where the, the, the north is like a sea of darkness? Pyongyang at night looks like Times Square. They are really heavily into neon lights and pictures and things like that, unquote. So that's uh, President Carter on his trip to North Korea in 1994. Carter had been taken to a giant Potemkin village. And he came back and said exactly what they wanted. 
In fact, he didn't say it. He sat at a typewriter and typed it because it was in a journal that he did for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. So he had a time to sit and look at it and think, well, maybe I don't know if I should compare it to Walmart. You know, Time to think about it, retype it, get it back, hit the send button, take it. So, All right, good enough. Uh, thank you for your time. I'd like to hear any questions that you have, if you're not depressed. <laughs> My goal is to come here and depress everybody. Yes? Hey, Russell King. Um, I have a question about a more modern possible deception. You know, we've been having a lot of mass shootings lately, as you, you know from the news. And um, I once saw this book called Losing Our Sons, and, and the father of the man at the Arkansas um, uh, military recruiting station, the man that was killed there, he, he showed this film. And they traced the, the, the shooter to Yemen. He was trained in Yemen. And uh, we find in, in most of these mass shootings that the, the supposed um, cure for these shootings is gun control right. or mental health. Yeah. Now, in this case, neither gun control nor mental health right. is relevant. Yeah. Okay? And the, we, we had this shooting in Charleston, and, and the man made racist statements, yes. but we cannot necessarily conclude that he had racial motivations right. because the same sort of situation could could, could be uh, there as well. Oh, that's so, right. Can, can you talk about what deception might might be used in, in relationship to mass shooting? Yeah, there. That, in fact, if you go back and read, um, as I have, and this is like an occupational hazard, as I have to read all this stuff. I get up every morning, I read People's World, and I read the Communist Party USA website, and all that stuff. But uh, Pravda is Vestia. And uh, it, Phibus was really good in the 1980s at getting transcripts of all Soviet media shows, um, Moscow Studio 9 program. And they used to constantly use these examples of, of like American shootings and so forth to portray this West that was completely out of control, this America that was completely out of control, and to do things like uh, call for gun control or what, whatever, it was that, what, whatever it was that they wanted to do. So they've been, uh, they've been doing that kind of thing for a long time. One of the things I'm researching right now, John Lenchowski will appreciate this. In fact, I emailed John on it. I was researching the, uh, the Soviet role in the shooting of Pope John Paul II in uh, May 1981. And as soon as they started getting blamed for this, and rightly so, they immediately launched a propaganda uh, campaign to blame the shooting on the CIA. And you could find this all through communist literature throughout the 1980s. And you know they wanted to portray uh, Mahmoud Aliyasha, the shooter, as having been uh, not working for the KGB or the GRU, but the CIA. And what was amazing were the um, left-wing sources in the West that would pick the stuff up and use it. Because all of these things would feed in to, to the left's um, view of the United States, of what they wanted the United States to, what they wanted the United States to be. Another one that made it into into um, one of the hearings in Congress was there was a um, the Soviets concocted these really crude um, ads flyers that were supposed to be from the KKK, and they were calling for a banning of of blacks, black people generally, not African American, from the Olympic Games in 1984. And it was on this kind of KKK pseudo letterhead where it had a guy in like a white hood and it had some sort of really vile uh, racist slogan underneath it. And it showed like somebody being lynched and it would say like, no coloreds in the Olympic Games or something like this. And our government went to, you know, I guess somebody in our government went to the whatever branch of the KKK and the, the guys of the KKK said, we didn't do this. We've never, we've never seen this before. I mean, uh, and, and so they were, able to, they were able to trace that back to Moscow. Now, why would Moscow do that? Because they know that certain leftists in the United States would love that stuff. Oh, man. You know, if we could get this in our papers to show how sick racist we are, then this would be, this would be just wonderful. Yeah, to portray and, and so the Soviets were masters at, at realizing how beautiful that stuff worked. Carter. Um, Paul, can you talk about really good? It's kind of uh, expeditious. Your book there will take that. Can you just give us your comments on the Supreme Court? On, on the Supreme Court, well, I'll, tell you, I'll put it within the context of what I'm talking about. Okay. In, in, um, in, in the book Takedown, I go through, um, and this is, as I said, winning me all kinds of friends, but I go through 
the left's 200 year attempt to redefine and reshape and take down what you would call probably the natural, traditional, biblical, Judeo-Western, right, nuclear family and marriage. Robert Owen, Charles Fourier, those early socialist utopians were doing in the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s. Robert Owen, July 4th, 1826, his Declaration of Mental Independence at his New Harmony Colony. The Oneida Colony, John Humphrey Noyes' Colony, they were doing group marriages, they were trying to redefine marriage. They don't like the idea of male-female marriage. Uh, Marx and Engels in the Communist Manifesto write of abolition of the family, which in 1848 they could already call an infamous proposal of the communists. Marx wrote to Engels, blessed is he who has no family. How's that for a twist on the Beatitudes? And, uh, and Engels loved that because Engels didn't want a family, and Marx was not a very good family man himself. Engels had all these different mistresses who he refused to marry. Engels was, was preaching the, the 1960s phrase, smashing monogamy, in the 1880s. Uh, and then the cultural Marxists started redefining gender, sexuality. Um, they wanted open marriages. They wanted non-traditional marriage. So I go through in the book this like 200-year effort by the left to take down marriage. And what really opened my eyes to this was, because like I said, because I read People's World every day and Communist Party USA website, I started noticing about four or five years ago how the American Communist Party have become fanatics for gay marriage. I mean, they are, um, they've, they've, they've adopted the entire gay agenda. Here's a really amazing thing. This group will appreciate this. Fidel Castro is said to support same-sex marriage. And they've actually been holding gay pride marches in Havana for like eight years now. Now, you guys know this. Castro used to throw gay people in prison and lunatic asylums. He tried to deport thousands of them out of the country in the Mariel boat lift. You ever see the beginning of the movie Scarface? When Al Pacino, right, they're asking Al Pacino if he's gay. Right? That's because Castro was ridding his country of what he saw as vile, unsavory, lunatic homosexuals. Castro is now totally pro-gay, and Mariella Castro, Raul's daughter, is heading up the Sex Institute there. They're trying to do gay marriage in Castro's Cuba. So I started thinking, why are the communists suddenly so pro-gay marriage? They kicked Harry Hay out of the Communist Party, the gay communists in the 1950s. And uh, really, I think the only explanation that fits is that this finally allows them to fulfill what they've been trying to do for 200 years, which is redefine and reshape and take down the natural, traditional, biblical family. Now, that doesn't mean that same-sex marriage advocates in America are Marxists, because they're not. And 95, 99% of the people who advocate same-sex marriage are not part of a communist plot. They're not communists, and they're not thinking, oh, I want to help the commies abolish the family. But flipping it around, the communists see that 99% as wonderful for their efforts and what they've been trying to do. So it's a fascinating thing. It makes total sense that they would be totally on board for same-sex marriage. And all their different ideas for redefining family in the past, they could never, ever, 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 ever get even 10% support on anything. And to now have five justices on the Supreme Court with them and have a majority of Americans supporting it, they're amazed, they're baffled, but they are thrilled beyond belief. Yes? Uh, Mr. Cameron, thank you very much for all of all that you do, not only the books, but uh, say your writings in the American Thinker. Oh, thank you. I have two questions. One, the first one would be uh, to take your starting point where you talked about Christian charity. Uh, I understand why you call them dupes. Yes. But in calling them innocent as doves, there's a first part of that, and is I send you out as sheep among the wolves. So right. Be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Exactly. Every single uh, person you mentioned, and I'm sure throughout your book, is an elitist. Yes. Uh, and if Christ is angry at one thing, it's hypocrisy. Right. right. The strongest passages in the Gospels have to do with hypocrisy. Right. And uh, it, wouldn't you agree that they're not so innocent? Yes. No, I agree with that. And they. Uh... And also to, in fact, the heroes in my book are the people who kind of woke up and redeemed themselves. Even Dewey, I have a chapter called The Redemption of John Dewey, 
where he's very good on the Trotsky trials. But in part, that's because Sidney Hook and leftists and progressives are pro-Trotsky. But still, he did good work in the, in the Trotsky trials. But, but you're really on to something there. And the one thing that, that gets to me again and again is you know, progressive professors and so forth, they're the most cynical bunch you'll ever see, right? They are, they are smarky. They're always rolling their eyes. They're always you know, uh, sarcastic. But when it comes to some of the stuff on the left, they are, the, they are just supple prey. I mean, they just fall for it, like Mugridge said, like school children reciting uh, multiplication tables. All, all this skepticism and pessimism is suddenly gone when you've got a Soviet central planner in front of you that says, uh, and now here at, at this building, we are producing and comes up with some incredible, instead of their usual cynicism and skepticism goes, that's amazing. <laughs> Wait till they hear about this in the West. Those right wingers, those McCarthyites. So it's uh, it, really we're looking at. I think with so many things that we're dealing with with people from that persuasion, it requires almost a psychological explanation. A lot of it's emotional and psychological, even more than it's. Like Mugridge said, they um, they went there wanting to believe, and damn it, nothing was gonna nothing was gonna move them away from that belief. Good. The second question would be, uh, how, what difference do you see between the classic problem in Zvesti of the Soviet times and the mainstream media in this country? Yeah. Well, well I mean, in terms of, I, I, I'll say this. Covering it, for, for the regime, the big lines. Right. I'll say this. In, in, in a way, uh, and I'll be very careful about how I say this because I don't want it to be uh, misused. In a way, what we have is worse because, <laughs> because the media then in the Soviet Union was controlled. And anybody who wanted to say something different couldn't because of threat under, by the state. So in other words, those quote unquote journalists had an excuse. And besides, most of them weren't journalists. They were working for the KGB. You weren't actually a free journalist doing, doing free journalism. But here we have something that in a way is kind of worse which is they're not controlled by the state at all, but they're so biased toward a particular ideology or particular party or particular president that, um, that they end up doing the bidding for that person. They don't even realize it. They don't even see that bias. The, I, I would tell liberals all the time they would hate this. They hate it when I say it, but um, Rush Limbaugh is more honest than the New York Times. Because Rush Limbaugh tells you exactly what he believes. He comes out and he says, I'm a conservative. You're going to get from me three hours of right-wing stuff. <laughs> Here is my bias. I am a total conservative. I don't like Obama. I hope he fails. I vote for Republicans. And then you get the New York Times like, well, I'm an objective journalist, and we don't take sides here either way. And that's just, that's just complete dishonesty. And I, and I can't read just blatant dishonesty. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't respect that. The Times has, in other words, the Times has an agenda too. It's a left-wing agenda. But they don't, they don't admit it. And, and, that's, and that's very dishonest. John. Paul, this is your research into the uh, Mattachine Society, which I, yes. I recall was kicked out of the Communist Party. Uh, Evelyn Hooker, whose uh, psychological study was responsible for homosexuality being classified as a mental illness in 1973, provided the uh, test subjects uh, for, her, uh, for her, and I was just wondering if you did any research. Right, on not on her, but in takedown. Harry Hay. Harry Hay was one of the founders of the gay movement. In fact, his biographer, Timmons, calls him uh, you know, one of the core founders, if not the founder of, of the gay left. And he was, um, he was a communist. He was a hardcore Communist Party member and organizer. He, uh, his entire life, he had, he had been gay. He got married for about 13 years, like 1938, 51, something like that, where he tried to hold together a heterosexual marriage, but couldn't really do it. He was attracted to men. He, was, he simply wasn't attracted to women. He was attracted to men. But anyway, the, so he started, before he was a communist, he was, he was gay. Uh, the you know the communist ideology came later, and by the way, the person who brought him into the communist party, that brought Harry Hay into the communist party, was Will Gear, 
the actor who played Grandpa Walton on The Waltons. Yeah, Will Gear was a was a big leftist, pro-communist, uh, bisexual. Uh, not homosexual. He he was married and had kids as as well. But uh, yeah, that's something they weren't telling on The Waltons in in the in, in the nineteen seventies. But uh, Will Gear brought uh, Harry Hay into 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 radical politics, and so Harry Hay was. And I said the Communist Party kicked Harry Hay out. Here's how, here's how it really worked. Some people in the Communist Party were bothered by homosexuality. Some weren't. Whitaker Chambers was uh, bisexual uh, before, you know, prior, to, prior to getting married, and then he changed. But they, uh, the, the Communist Party, the problem the Communist Party had with gays was the same, party that the US, same problem that the federal government and the military had with them was that they were subject to blackmail. And the Communist Party, Communist Party USA, was being watched unlike any organization by the FBI. And so if you had a gay communist, he could easily be blackmailed by whoever. And, uh, and the Soviets, of course, were masters at blackmail. So they were, you know, they were good at doing this as well. So really what's going on is they would, CPUSA would look the other, Communist Party USA would look the other way um, if there was a particularly useful and really good gay communist who wasn't really out of the closet and they could get away with it. Harry Hayes' sexuality became too clear. And so really what happened was he wasn't kicked out of the Communist Party, but he left voluntarily because he saw what problems he could create. So he formed the Mattachine Society, which was the first gay communist group. Yes? Well, just, excuse me, this is just to, on what you were saying there. The, the US intelligence community and, and internal security community was more concerned about uh, about homosexuals within the classified arena, arena right, right. because to a very large extent, not so much because of blackmail, but because the KGB looked upon them as psychologically um, we vulnerable. Yes. At war with themselves, right, they really at war with the society, and therefore much more manipulable than others. Yes, and and so it was less a blackmail issue than than than, uh, than being able to exploit the conflicting emotions Good. within. Yes, yeah, the, in fact, I think it's in one of Oleg Kalugin's books. He has a couple pages on this, and how they. Um, I mean, the Soviets would really abuse these men when when they could, and I mean, you could if they they would use homosexuals in another way to try to blackmail other individuals who who they who they thought could be blackmailed, and they uh, and if they didn't agree, they they would literally send them off to prison. So. Yes. Out of curiosity, uh, my name's Jackson. By the way. Um, were there any examples of the Soviets trying to dupe uh, people more on, on the right wing or and even successes of that? Not unless, I mean, there were some people who were more moderate Republicans like Mark Hatfield, who, uh, who, who they saw as more friendly that they, could, that they could use and manipulate. But really the thinking was, if you, um, if you were on the left, you were just more, much more likely to be uh, to find common ground, to be a fellow traveler. So it was much more easy to get you to a peace march uh, because those people tended to be left-wingers rather than, than right-wingers. But uh, I do have a few examples in the book of some, some right-wingers who were duped in different instances. And, uh, and also, to be fair, there were some really good anti-communist liberals who tried to warn other liberals, and these are really my heroes in the book, about being duped. Arthur Schlesinger was one of them. Great piece for Life magazine he wrote in 1946, warning liberals about, about being duped. And, uh, and a lot of them just, just, just simply laughed at him. Yes? Last week was a rather demoralizing uh, week for uh, conservatives, among whom I call myself one. Um, are there any further um, demoralizations in front of us before <laughs> the sine wave Turns again. No, I, I, we have two, 200 years 
of a trend right. that cannot go on forever. Yes. So when do you foresee it moving in another direction? I think it's only going to get far. Um, because what, what's, what's going to happen now, especially with gay marriage being a constitutional right, is that the left, especially the atheistic and secular left, is going to use that as a club to really hammer and attack religious believers. And so for religious believers, it's going to get very difficult. I mean, if, if you're a baker or florist or photographer and you don't want to photograph or provide a cake or, or whatever for a same-sex ceremony, they're, they're, they are not going to let you disagree. They're not. You're either going to have to lie and say, I'm busy, I can't do that wedding that date, or you're going to be fined or you're going to be shut down. I think the only thing that the left is going to allow for a little while is for certain churches and certain religious groups to, um, to be religious on strictly religious grounds to oppose same-sex marriage. But that's not going to last for a while either, especially as you have more liberal denominations that are embracing gay marriage. And I'm already getting emails from different people who say things like, uh, hey, Ken Gore, you're Roman Catholic, and you're citing your pope and the magisterium of the church for your position for opposing same-sex marriage. But look at this poll. 55% of Catholics support gay marriage. You know? So, you know, so the real answer, Ken Gore, is that you're a homophobe and that you hate gay people. And I'll, and I'll say, well, I, I don't. I just don't support redefining marriage. That's all. I mean, I, you know, give me any anti-discrimination law you want. I just don't support redefining. Uh, but but they, uh, so they're going to, and, and see, this is what really attracts the communists to this. Because not only, if you go to co the People's World website right now, the lead piece in the rotating window is a piece celebrating the Supreme Court ruling on Friday. They've been celebrating <laughs> Gay Pride Month at People's World every day with a new gay pride piece. I'm not exaggerating at all when I tell you you will find far more rainbow flags than you will red flags at the website of People's World, especially because they want to call themselves progressives, so they don't put up a red flag. But they've been having the rainbow symbol up there all, all month. They've been celebrating Stonewall, um, all kinds of different things. So you should have seen uh, People's World and CPUSA and the Communists over the Indiana thing, over the Indiana Religious Freedom Restoration Act. This was beautiful for them. This was so good for them because they've always hated religion more than anything else. Right? Marx called religion the opiate of the masses, said communism begins where atheism begins. Vladimir Lenin said there's nothing more abominable than religion. Lenin said, all worship of a divinity is a necrophilia. A necrophilia. Uh, religion, he said, is like venereal disease. That's what he said. The communists have always hated religion even more than private property, even more than the nuclear family. So with same-sex marriage giving them a chance to finally not only redefining the, 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 the traditional Judeo-Christian family, but to attack religion? I mean, this is a godsend to them. I mean, if they weren't atheists, they'd be shouting hallelujah. I mean, this is magnificent. And, the, and again, they are astounded to see that so many mainstream Americans would hand them this beautiful, you talk about a hammer and sickle. I mean, they, they, Catholic Charities in the state of Massachusetts is no longer doing adoptions. That is the oldest adoption agency in the United States. Even if, if the people who don't like the Catholic Church say, boy, the Catholic Church is in such a great job with hospitals and schools and adopting of children. They had to shut down in the state of Massachusetts and in Illinois because they won't adopt children into gay couples. Because they said, sorry, but our church's teaching is that Families and marriages are between one man and one woman, so we don't do that. So what they do in Massachusetts and in Illinois, they shut them down. They're no longer doing adoptions. Now, you would think that some people on the left would say, well, that's too bad because the Catholic Church actually did some good work there. It's too bad, you know, but, but you know, but they, you no, know, instead they're like, yeah, you know, good. You know, those fascists, those Nazis are... Take them down, right? So for them, this is great. And now when you can walk around and say that uh, gay marriage is a constitutional right, which it now is, 
it's going to be really, really, really hard for a group like Catholic Charities to, to do that. Like, like Scalia and Alito warned the solicitor in the gay marriage case before the Supreme Court. They said, yeah, but when, when marriage was being decided among the states, all the different states have their own constitution and different laws. You could have different rules in different states. They said, but if this becomes a national constitutional right, then these religious groups and places are going to be in violation of a constitutional right to marriage, aren't they? And she's like, well, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah. And Elena Kagan said that they didn't care. They voted the way that they did. So this is setting up. Uh, we're now go, we're, we are now in for a long period of religious persecution and, and church, state, acrimony, and hostility, and battles, and on and on and on repeat lawsuits unlike anything you've ever seen. Yes? So what are the elements of, let's start just with American society, that we could um, look to as exerting the maximum counter-influence over this wave of influence? All you could, all you could is uh, the next step for, for people who think like we do is to just, just get ready to fight this stuff legally. But you find out that when they have one judge that votes one way, they have a magical way of applying it in all 50 states. Yes. Well, they're out there. It's probably going to come mainly from religious groups. It's not going to come from conservative groups, I'll tell you that. I've never had as much trouble getting op-ed pieces published when promoting a book as I have with this particular book. And all the usual groups that I go to, the conservative groups and organizations, all the talk shows that I, that I do all the time, and anytime a new book comes out, I just email the, the, the producer or the talk show host himself, and hey, so-and-so, I, I won't say any first names, even that might give it away. Um, my new book is out. I'd love to come in and talk about it. I won't harass you. You know how it is. I ask one time, and then they always, oh, yeah, sure, Paul, here's some, they, this time. It's like, it's like the, the howling winds of Siberia. No response. No response. They're all afraid. They're all afraid to touch this. They're all afraid of being called haters, of having their advertisers attacked and boycotted. So this is uh, probably your only recourse is going to be is going to be church groups, and the left is going to make sure that the only slight, legally available form of objection, that you're going to be able to have, to this constitutional right of gay marriage will be your religious faith. But even that, not going to work very well, especially when the Lutheran Church, my old church, Presbyterian Church USA, they're doing gay marriage now, um, the Episcopal Church, I think. Right? So, yeah. Yeah. So as soon as they all start doing it again, they're going to say, no, 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 you're, you're not a Christian. You're an intolerant, hating Christian because all of these Christian groups are doing gay marriage. So you either get with it and go to a non-hating Christian denomination or we're going to come after you too. Yeah, we're, we're in big trouble, folks. We're, we, are, we are really in big trouble. John. Well, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on... Um, what the Bolsheviks did to use sexual revolution and sexual libertinism as a vehicle to break down the institutions of society. Yes. I mean, I, one thing that a lot of people don't know about is the fact that, that they wanted to break down marriage early on, I mean, yes. as part of the revolutionary process, so that that, in, in the first years of the Bolshevik regime, entailed the nationalization of women. Right. Where your wife was now no longer your wife, she was everybody's woman, mm -hmm. according to however it worked out. And, and it was then, after they had succeeded in breaking everything down, that they decided, uh, when they had consolidated power, that it was time to restore sexual puritanism, yes. and gays were sent to the gulag. Right, right. I'm just wondering if you have any further reflections about this. Yeah, it's very interesting. I have two chapters on this. One is just on the Bolshevik war on the family and the divorce rate and the abortion, how it got so out of control. And I even have a chapter of Fulton Sheen writing on this in 1948. And Sheen is amazed at how by, by the time he was writing 
um, Communism and the Conscience of the West in 1948, where he's going over the havoc and hell wreaked on the Russian family by these new laws. Sheen was able to write at that point that, um, however, Stalin had started, Stalin had banned abortion because it got so out of control. And they made, divorce became the easiest thing in the world to do in Russia. I mean, if you wanted free speech or private property or freedom of assembly or freedom of religion, you couldn't do it. If you wanted a fur coat, you couldn't have it. If you wanted your own private bank account, you couldn't do it. But baby, if you wanted a divorce, the sky was the limit. Here's a postcard. Write it down here and drop it off at the mailbox. You're done. They made divorce the easiest thing in the world. And abortion, too. They had 3,000 um, abortion, 24-7, oh, constant time. They, they, this got so out of hand that not only did they crack down on it, but Sheen was quoting in his 1948 book, the Soviets started citing natural law. <laughs> it's like, it's like they're citing Aristotle and Augustine and Aquinas to argue the importance of the family, right? And they, they, you know, it just it got it got that bad. But what happened was after a few years of this, Khrushchev came in and said, "Look, are we going to be communists or not?" Right? I mean, come on. If we're going to be communists, there's no such thing as natural law, religion we hate. We've got to take down the family. You got to bring abortion. All you need, all of these different things, and so uh, so they they brought them all back and start started working it. The uh, the sexuality stuff. Wilhelm Reich, one of the cultural Marxists, went there in the 1920s and complained that the Soviets they were doing some good things on divorce and so forth, but they weren't allowing enough homosexuality. Said Wilhelm Reich. And if you wanted to be a real revolutionary, he wrote this in his book, The Sexual Revolution, you needed to allow homosexuality, bisexuality, and everything else. And Wilhelm Reich, being a Frankfurt School cultural Marxist, along with Herbert Marcuse and, 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 and these others, they, they supplied, they combined Marxism with Freudianism. They said the missing ingredient in Marxist thought is Freud. We need to fuse Freud and Marx, and then we can really get the takedown that we need. And so for them, they were arguing that human beings are really naturally can have sex with either gender at any age and as early as four or five, which is Wilhelm Reich writes about trying to have sex with a family nursemaid when, he was, when they would share a bed together when he was four years old. And uh, he was an interesting character. Well, I can't even have my students read that chapter. Um, I mean, Wilhelm Reich was messing around with the farm animals, doing everything. I mean, he was sexually psychotic. He, he had some real issues go, go, going on there. So they argued that uh, to be real revolutionaries, you needed... And that's where the 60s new left pick up, picked all of us up. The Weather Underground said, you have to smash monogamy. And Bernadine Dorn and the ladies said, a woman does not need a man, including for sex. And so women were to have sex with women. Mark Rudd and Bill Ayers both talk about you know, the importance of trying to have sex with the same sex. And Rudd, who was just had an insatiable sexual desire, who slept with as many women as he possibly could, um, talks about doing his best to try to fondle his best friend, JJ. But uh, he said, you know, these cultural inhibitions, man, they're just too much. Maybe it's biological, Mark. Did you think it, it has to be cultural? So he tried, but, but he couldn't. Bill Ayers, on the other hand, really, really, really tried, and Bill was able to pull it off. So he was able to have um, a, a bisexual sex, including regular sex with his, um, um, his best friend. He talks about that in his September 11, 2001 interview in the New York Times, the one where he talked about... Um, uh, it's called No Regrets for a Love of Explosives, where, where, where Bill Ayers on September 11, 2001, in the New York Times, talks about having no regrets for attacking the Pentagon in New York, back when they were in the Weather Underground. That's in the September 11, 2001, New York Times. Read that interview. It's very, very enlightening. All right, I guess I better stop, right, 3 o'clock? Good enough. I don't want to keep you uh, good people too long. I'm sure I'm depressing all of you. And uh, yeah, look, all you got to do is uh, you live in this world. You try to make it a better place. 
And uh, back on the point on charity, I'm supposed to have faith, hope, and charity. Well, Chesterton said that hope is about having hope when things seem hopeless. Right? Amen. Thanks. Thank you, Paul.